Thanks for coming. Um, we met Mike a couple of time, times before, and it was all in the uh, experience. Uh, a couple of things. Um, how would you uh, rate our our voter rolls? How pure are the voter rolls today? How pure are our voter rolls? Um, so I don't know how you classify that per se. Uh, if you want an A, B, C kind of thing, I give us a B plus. A. There's a lot of conversation around uh, uh, making the voter rolls uh, good, mm -hmm. so they're, they're not so they're accurate. How accurate are the voter rolls today? So, um, how accurate are the voter rolls? Um, that's a hard question to answer, and I'll tell you why it's a hard question to answer. One is, um, I know how many people we took off. That was thirty thousand. I know how many people we put back on. That's fifteen thousand. Was so, but how many of those people want to be back on and will be back on before the general? It's there's no you don't there's no way to know the exact right answer. So there's no way to know exactly where we're at. Having said that. I think we're pretty darn good. Uh, we do a lot of list maintenance. We do more than the state requires, but we do the list maintenance as much as we can. Is it perfect? No. Um, I can tell you, having worked in the elections office in Sarasota or Manatee for the last 20 plus years, 23 years, um, the process has increased. The, uh, resources available to us have increased beyond um, in 2000 when I started the only way we knew someone had died we went through the obituary every day that was somebody's job to go through the obituary and they would go down look for the name up and see oh yeah this person he's dead date, date matches name matches we'll take them off the list that was that was all we had let me ask you one other follow-up question. Um, how much, how well did Eric go through in making those voter rolls as good as it did? Um, Eric was a double-edged sword for us in some regards. Uh, we got a lot of good information off of Eric. What I don't know is how much bad information. The way Eric was set up was so that all the information went to the state. None of it went directly to the county. The state then did their magic and then sent us basically a list and told us what to do with it. Um, so how good was it? I don't really know. I just know what we got and generally it did help. We did remove and where it really helped is if you were registered in multiple states. If you were you moved down from Ohio, moved to Florida, hadn't told Ohio that you moved, we had you registered, Ohio had you registered, that's where we saw the biggest benefit is finding people that were registered in multiple states. How much benefit did we get versus the competition? Um, I, I'm assuming by the competition you're talking about parties. Party. Um, <coughs> we did not see a huge I think the fear was, honestly, and I think this is where you're going, the fear was that the people that were either Eric or the state, because it, for us, we didn't really know what the data was when it started, we just know what it was when we got to us. The fear was someone was kind of cherry picking one party over the other. I could tell you from our looking at it, I mean, we're 40% Republican, and the numbers kind of seem to match the total registrations, mostly. Um, it wasn't perfect. The other thing that is, is uh, hard to look, you know, if you, and I have a slide on this because it gets kind of into the weeds, but if you look at the demographics of the different people that are registered in the different parties, right? If you look at those who are registered Republicans, they're 40, 50, 60 and above. There's not a lot of 20, 30 and 40 year olds registered as Republicans. The higher you get, I guess you're smart enough. I don't know. Um, 
Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you one last, last question. <laughs> so, how many people came across the southern border or voting in our elections? So I can't. So you're talking about citizenship. What I'm going to tell you, citizenship is one of those things. Again, going back to 2000 when I started, there was no citizenship check, none, zero zilch. If you check the box on the application, that's all we had to go by. Today, what we have, we do not have, do not have the resources I wish we had. Uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security does not give us a list of those known you know known aliens or unknown aliens my point being we don't have the only uh, database we have access to is dmv dmv if you had asked me 10 years ago was horrible today it's actually pretty good and and it, it goes back to the real id if you're familiar with real id in florida and nationwide in order to get a driver's license you have to provide certain amount of documentation to prove that you are who you say you are one of those things is a birth certificate or a, a passport. If you have a passport, you have provided your birth certificate in order to get the passport. Um, so if you have the real ID, we have pretty high confidence that you're either a citizen or not a citizen. That is all tracked through Florida Highway Safety and Motor Vehicle. Um, and so that is what we have. So what I'm gonna tell you is we do, I know, because every year one or two come up, and usually the way we find them is they are registering to try and gain citizenship. When you try and get citizenship, one of the things that uh, is done is they ask the county in which you live, or actually the state, for um, proof that they either are or are not registered to vote. And I know for a couple of um, people, it kept them from getting their citizenship because they were registered to vote and they voted in an election <laughs> as an illegal alien. So it, it kept them from getting their citizenship and they weren't allowed to apply, I think it was for another five years or something along those lines. So I know that there are some, but I also know that that number has never been very large, but it is decreasing. The better the DMV database gets, the better um, I can guarantee that there are non-citizens voting. Hopefully AI is going to help us out with this, right? <laughs> I don't, I don't know about that, but yes, there are people working on AI and trying to get their, you know, there are companies that are focusing on that. Hey, thanks for coming. My question is: I recently uh, uh, watched uh, Secretary of State talk to a committee up on, on in Capitol Hill, or the Capitol rather, and he was talking about, you know, the the uh, the machines are. You know they're certified and everything and that he follows this and the whole state follows this and of course the law says you got to have the cyber security up you know and he admitted that they don't so my question is if that is true mm -hmm. how often do you guys because because if you look at it when we started filling back the onion it's 2005 standards is what he was doing so that means you could have an xp and you could have a seven which are deprecated operating systems it's an it person you should you know, mm -hmm. you're familiar with that. So my question to you is, how often do you pen test and how often do you update the software and firmware on those machines? And have you ever tried, ever done, they've done a man in the middle test? As a cybersecurity guy, I can tell you, if you guys are not doing any of that, those machines are very vulnerable. And he was admitting that they do have modems in them. So, and whether or not saying it's on the internet to a cyber guy is, is kind of BS because any, your phone has a modem in it, it's on the net, you know, so that you can you can still get into it. So that's that's my question. Okay, so there's a lot of questions there. That yeah, wasn't one sorry. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start by um, telling you what I think you already know, and that is the way it works in Florida is Florida must certify the system before we're allowed to use it. When they certify, and, and right now there are only two companies in Florida that are certified. They have um, maybe three versions, two, two from one company and two from the other company. They're versions of their software that is certified. Those certifications include um, the operating system. It includes uh, all of the firmware, all of the levels. 
We are not allowed to change those operating systems and levels until the state recertifies it. So they're never updated. So they are not updated until the state recertifies it with a new version. Um, the, the assurance that I'm gonna try and give you and I can tell you it probably isn't gonna satisfy you. Um, they are not on the internet. They never touch the internet. And I know you're not gonna believe me, but they don't. Do they have a modem in them? Yes, they do. Um, the truth is, I would be fine taking it out. I don't really care. You know why I don't care? It doesn't save me any money, and it doesn't save me any time. Not a, not a minute. As a matter of fact, it costs me more time. Why is it there? Because in Florida, the US in general, any election that you don't know the result of that night, there's a problem with that election. That is the perception. That is that is what we have come to as a society, basically. Yes. We have decided that if you don't know the result that night, there is a problem. Yep. The only way for us to get the results that quickly is to have those motives. Jarvis Williams, I just recently went to the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles mm -hmm. and uh, upgraded my, my uh, voting record and my license, etc. And uh, people are flying in and out of there. And if you were somebody that was just uh, observing, making an observation, you say, well, there's probably a lot of illegal people in there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my feeling. But, your boss told us in a, in a talk uh, here a couple of uh, years ago that he answered a direct question. I said, can you assure me that illegals are not voting in Florida? He said, no. So you're asking me the same question? Yes. Okay. Um, can I assure you there are no illegals registered to vote in Florida? No, I cannot assure you that. And until we have a method to verify that you are a citizen before we register you, I will never be able to assure you that. Now understand, prior to 1996 in Florida, in order to register to vote, you had to show up in person. You had to provide certain identification with you in order to register in Florida. There was a, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with it, there was what was called the Motor Voter Act. It took effect in 1996. What that meant was now you can register at DMV. When you get your driver's license, when you change your driver's license, you can also do your voter registration. The other thing that went along with that, though, was it removed the it removed the requirement, and not only did it remove the requirement, it removed us from making it a requirement that you appear in person. There are tons of voters that we have never seen, will never see. So the only way I could ever assure you is if we could also ask for some of the same information that DMV asks for, like a birth certificate, a passport, some other piece of information. Right now that's illegal, I can't ask for that. It's, it's a, um, it's a constant, I mean, honestly, as I understand it, have been told it's a constitutional rights issue. Right? Your right to vote is a constitutional right if I were to ask you to come and provide that information, I would be infringing upon that right in order to do so. It would be a step above what you need to, to produce. It's the, it, it goes along with the poll tax. We can't, um, there have been, we had the requirement in Florida to, to um, have voter or identification, produce identification when you vote. When you go to the polls, you have to produce identification. There, um, it's been a requirement in Florida for a long time. A lot of states have tried to add it. They've basically said, no, you can't add it because it's a poll tax. You have to get, you know, it, it puts a hindrance on voters to go to the to DMV in order to get that ID in order for them to have the right to vote. You are in hindering their right to vote. Uh, the only way that Florida gets a lot away with it or around that is they allow more options for ID than just your driver's license. So the answer is no. The, what I'm saying is the better the DMV is, the better we are at finding them. 
But there, I cannot guarantee you there was, is no illegal citizen that's registered to vote. And the only way I ever could is if I could also ask, require that information. Having said that, I don't want to scare you into like there's hundreds of thousands of illegals registered to vote. There really isn't. There um, might be this year. What's that? I said there might be this year. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm saying. In order to register to vote now, and to register to vote, all of your information is compared against DMV. And if that doesn't match, if it says you're not a citizen, you're not allowed to register to vote anymore. Anybody that is illegally here and registered did so probably more than 10 years ago. Yes. But when you um, do like go to the um, poll worker class, you can actually give like a student ID or the back of a credit card. Well, I don't understand the back of a credit card being that anybody can get a credit card or a bank card. I don't understand that form of ID. Uh, the school one doesn't prove you're a citizen either. Well, so really, that that requirement, that statutory requirement to produce ID when you vote is not, the requirement is not intended to make sure that you're a citizen. The requirement is intended to make sure you are the person you are presenting yourself to be. Your, your picture matches and your signature matches. Um, but, I mean, should it... Shouldn't the main requirement be that you're a U.S. citizen? Yeah. Not, not who you say you are. I, mean, I could say I'm anybody. I could probably open a credit card in someone else's name, actually. But, you know, the main requirement to vote should be that you're a U.S. citizen. That should be the main number one. And it, it is a requirement to register to vote. What I'm trying to express is that it's not at the point in which you present that ID that that is being checked. It is being checked when you register to vote. At that point, when you go to the polls, the reason that we ask for the ID is to, to verify that you are the person you say, not whether or not you're a citizen. That was checked earlier. The other thing I'm gonna say is the reason it's not limited to federal ID, such as a Florida driver's license or a Florida ID, is back to where I was saying that every other state that has tried to limit it to that has gotten ruled it's unconstitutional because it puts basically a poll tax or a hindrance uh, on the voter. That's still backwards to me because it's a more of a hindrance to the citizen to let people who are non-citizens mm -hmm. vote. I'm not going to argue well, against you. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to explain. It doesn't make common sense. It's just not common sense to me. But I get what you're saying. This doesn't make sense. When you get your digital ID. Oh, I'm not going to get one. <laughs> it won't be me that gets a digital ID. Trust me. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, a couple weeks ago, I forget how long it was, I read an article or saw an article, I think it might have been in the Observer or something, saying that Mike Bennett was the stingiest person around, meaning mm -hmm. that 10 years ago the budget was 1.2 million, now it's like 1.3 million or something, it's gone up very little. Right. Um, in, your, in your term, the 10 years that you've been there now, I explain, since you are his chief of staff, uh, you've had very little turnover because there are very few people, are, I, I never see an article saying we're hiring. <laughs> Everyone is pretty much there and they've been there for 20, 10 plus years, whatever. Um, explain that within your office, since you've been there, the budget increase or less increase, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, the type of people that you do have, do you have much turnover? Because I, ha I haven't seen much myself. Um, going to the budget directly, uh, it was the observer that ran the article. I don't remember exactly what the numbers are, but when we started in 2013, the budget was about 2.9 million, if I remember correctly. And to this last budget, we asked for 3.1 million. So over over 10 years, I don't know what that percentage is, but it's pretty low. Um, most of that budget increase, I'm gonna tell you right now, has gone to salaries, uh, which is kind of leads into your second question. We don't have a huge amount of turnover. And part of the reason is, is because we try and treat our employees well. I mean, I'm not going to say we've never had someone retire because we have or leave because we have, but it's not a lot. And that, and we're a small office, right? We have about uh, 16 full-time employees plus the supervisor of elections. Uh, so 
It's not, it's not like well, we're the county who's hiring 100 people every other day. Very. So you're not going to be, naturally, we wouldn't have a lot of turnover anyway, but either way, we, we, we don't. Yes. Uh, can you speak to some of the issues involved in absentee voting? Speak to some of the issues involved in absentee voting. Um, so there, absentee voting, the, the worry, right, is that someone is going to get ballots that aren't belong, don't belong to them. They're going to, or someone's going to get ballots from somebody else and steal their ballots. Or um, this uh, ballot harvesting has become a kind of a popular term. Uh, um, we do have mechanisms in place to identify a couple of things. One is if we get a lot of ballot requests from the same place, that, that throws a, a trigger, a red flag to us immediately. It's it, it built into the system. If we get more than five requests from the same IP address, we instantly get a notification. What's going on? It's not always wrong. Sometimes it's a library. Um, sometimes it's a, a retirement home and everything. So it's not always a bad thing. I'm not trying to say it is, but we do have uh, mechanisms in place to stop that. Um, good or bad, vote by mail, the main um, identifier for your vote by mail ballot is your signature. That's one, that we sent it to you and we send it to your address, two, that we got it back and it has your signature on it. The signature matches what we have on file. Those are the main things. In order to get a ballot that is not that does not go to the address in which you're registered, you must make that request in writing. You must sign that request. So we have a written request from you saying, I need my ballot in Ohio. And we will do that. You're allowed to do that. When it comes back though, we're still gonna verify that we have a, the signature on that ballot matches the signature on our record for you. So is there, um, have we had circumstances where, where people have, usually it's husbands and wives, honestly, the wives try and sign the husband's ballot like they do their checks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so usually it's, it's or, we had a circumstance where a mother signed for her daughter who was off at school. We find that. We, we really do. Um, signatures are a good identifier. They really are. Are they perfect? No. But is it, is it, um, is it where you're going to see a bunch of fraud in it? No. Most of the fraud is family related. It's when a family member tries to help another family member out. That's most of what we see when we see this issue. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Quick question. One of the provisions of SB 5.4 was the creation of the Office of Election Crimes. Uh, has Manatee County ever referred a case to that office? We have, yes. Um, there's been probably since they were created five, five, maybe six cases or six things that we've sent them. Most of them are petition related. So as, as I've told you, all of these petitions for marijuana and abortion have been going around. They need 890,000. You know how they get that 890,000? They pay people to go out and get them. They pay them really well. They, having said that, they're not allowed to pay them per petition. It's not like they can say, here's, you give me a hundred petitions, I give you $5 a petition. But they, can make them hit quotas kind of thing. So what we've seen and most of what we sent them is all of a sudden we get a stack of petitions and they aren't really good. The signatures are bad, but you look at the handwriting on them and all the handwriting seems to match up pretty good. So we've sent several of those. There's one case where there's a petition maker in Southwest Florida between about Manatee County and Lee County who had an, an inordinate amount of dead people sign his petition. So triggers like that, I mean, we see it. I mean, the system won't let us take it for someone who's died. And um, so we've sent probably four or five cases like that. Um, there have been a couple of people that voted in multiple states. We've sent probably two or three of those. 
Um, some of that, honestly, though, when I haven't heard any of the results of any of their research, that is one of the things I, I wish they were a little quicker. But as I'm sure you understand, the 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 uh, hand of justice is slow. So I don't know what the outcome of any of this is or will be. I did hear on a couple of them, it was like a father-son <laughs> junior issue. Wasn't really the same person. It's just when you're talking about that number of people, you're gonna have that kind of confusion. So I don't know exactly how many we sent. It's probably in the five to six range and most of it is petition. <laughs> My question is about the rules and um, like you've mentioned, it is uh, it is a lot of work to maintain the voting rules and to make sure the people that should be voting are able to vote. Uh, can you explain the program where Nancy County is enrolling non-eligible voters? To the vote to the voter roll, it almost sounds like you know there was a program that you found that created a problem. If I understood, I, why, I'm, why, I'm why not are, sure we don't intentionally register any non eligible person to vote. And it's, if we were, I definitely wouldn't be proud of it. What um, do you say? What do you say earlier that people between age 16 to 18? Oh, okay. That's our, 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 our right. Can you, it was almost like people mm -hmm. register you to vote, even though you can't vote for two more years, maybe, and you get the privilege of coming in one years and old. So, so that program, that is a state, that's a state law. That's not a Manatee County thing. It's called pre-registration. Um, going back into the 60s, you were allowed to register when you turned 17. Again, it was pre-registration. You're basically allowed to fill out the paperwork. We would put you in the system. Of course, your date of birth goes with that. Until you turned 18, once you turned 18, we would send you your voter registration ID, and then you were allowed to vote at that point. <laughs> Um, I don't remember when exactly, it's probably around 2004, 2006, they made that 16. Instead of 17, they made it 16. And the logic of it was when you went to go get your driver's license, it was easy for you to register and vote at the same time. It's not, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a law, it's not a BMT thing. You're allowed to pre-register is what it's called, pre-register to vote at 16. You are allowed to be a poll worker as soon as you're registered to vote. There are a lot of counties that do it. This is not an us thing. This is a state thing. You're it's just legally allowed to be a poll worker at 16 if you're registered to vote. We don't have a lot of them. Most of them are 17 or 18 or 17. Right. So are you going back to your challenge of keeping the voter roll clean? Mm -hmm. Is there any activity or any movement to change that so that, that these people are not sitting on the voter rolls? up to two years before they can actually vote. Is there any activity to change that? To change the law? To change that law. I have not heard of anybody trying to change that law. Um, again, you're technically not on the vote. I mean, you don't show up in the, the numbers. Like if, if you were to run a report of how many people are registered to vote, that person is not considered, but they are pre-registered. No question here. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lincoln. My question is, um, the NGO, non-governmental organization called Florida Supervisors of Elections, uh, every SOV in the state of Florida, all 67 counties, are members of this organization. I want to know what benefit is each county getting from the membership of the SOV belonging to this organization? So you're talking about the Florida Supervisor of Elections yes. Association. It's a um, it's an association of supervisors of elections. It's they have conferences where they get together and they talk about the new laws. The Secretary of State, the Department of State, come and explain the new laws. There are sessions they have on different things, but mostly surrounding new law. Recently. It's there have been a lot of new laws, so a lot of it is focused on the new laws. But that NGO is not like a state-sanctioned NGO, is it? I mean, if, if uh, our SOE is being trained, they would get it from the state, not this NGO. 
The state and does parents. not provide training. Um, they would not provide training to us. This is this is the way we get it from the state. Uh, it, I, it's it's just a professional association. Um, I can tell you that I know the clerk's office has one, the tax collector has one, the property appraiser has one, the county has one, municipal um, officials have them. They're, all they are intended to do is allow um, people with similar issues and, and similar job descriptions to come together and figure out how to do things better and more efficiently. They have no say in how things are done. They just, it's, it's more of a, an association to allow people to come together. Well, two years ago, when their website, one of their main goals was to get implemented in every county. And that um, turned out to be a disaster because every voter roll in every county was inflated after Eric. Yeah. Would you Actually, Eric dropped our voter rolls quite a bit, probably in Nancy County by about 2,500, 3,000 people as soon as Eric was instituted um the truth is I, I know the association did lobby for eric when it came out um it wasn't a county by county thing it was a statewide thing uh, the counties could not opt in or opt out of eric it was done at the state level it wasn't something that we could even uh we did had no um choice in the matter one way or the other i do know the association did like i said lobby for eric because one of the one of the things that we just don't have access to is nationwide database of where people are voting in other states or registered in other states. Uh, we don't have access to that. Well, the only problem is, is somebody does have access to it. It's not on our side. They can make that vote any way they want. We have a lower voter uh, roll. It could be a good reason for that. Someone else had the finger on the stick. And it wasn't us. I, what, what I, I meant originally and what I said originally was I can't really talk to how good Eric was because the only thing I ever saw was what the state sent us. I didn't see the data coming in, but that it was all done at the state level, which I, I mean, what we saw, some of it was good. I mean, it, it, it provided us with information we didn't know that everybody's had. I understand that there is a um, there is this feeling that Eric could have been wrong and it could have been i wouldn't know but it did there is a hole there still whether the hole was there while eric was there there is still a hole there that has there there's nothing been made to fill well as far as uh, overall so jack gave that, the mic to somebody several minutes ago and two people tried to speak in her place yeah. thank you yeah yes yes ma'am go ahead okay so um i'll ask you you said you've been at this a really long time um have you seen 2000 news i have seen 2000 news so maybe not in your official capacity but because of your experience and so forth um there are so many people that believe the election was stolen in 2020 and i would just be interested what you might want to say or maybe you don't want to say anything about that but you know it seems as if in Manatee County, it's, you know, uh, maybe everything's much better than in other places. Florida certainly did a lot after what, what the 2000 election did in change, can you chat it? But, you know, um, in other places, it's, you know, obviously there's a lot of funny business going on and a lot of people just don't trust elections, supervisor elections. I know people that refuse to vote now because they don't believe in the integrity of the system. So, I don't know. That, anyhow, I, it, it needs to be, once again, it needs to be addressed. Sure. So, um, I'll, I'll talk about two things. One is 2000 Mule specifically was talking about what is called, called now ballot harvesting. Uh, the idea, at the time 2000 Mules was um, release in Florida ballot harvesting was not illegal. So part of the problem is ballot harvesting has a wide uh, definition. Different people use it for different terms. Um, so someone, I know someone who lived in a uh, condominium association, was president of the condominium association, 
And a week before the election, he would go down and people in that association would hand them their ballot, sealed and signed. He would bring back 30 or 40 ballots, put them in the box. Was not even. Really no, no. Um, and I understand. I'm saying that is technically ballot harvesting. Um, what most people are worried about is not that so much as they're worried about the people that are going house to house, getting their ballot before they voted, or helping them vote it, taking their ballot and returning a large quantity at two, three o'clock in the morning, whatever. Um, I can tell you we did not see that in Manatee County, and I don't think we really saw much of it in Florida, but definitely not in Manatee County. Talking about uh, whether or not the election was stolen, all I can talk about is, is Manatee County, honestly. Florida a little bit, but mostly just Manatee County. Uh, I, The rest of the state, the rest of the country, I only know as much as you do by reading the news, the articles, the opinions, all of that stuff. I don't know any more about it. I can tell you that I think Manatee County has very safe and secure elections. I don't think there's a lot of fraud in Manatee County. And, and the fraud you see, most of the fraud we see that we find is again, it's husbands and wives, it's you know, it's family members that are, are going a little bit above and beyond what they should in order to, to get that vote counted. Um, I, I don't know that that answers your question, but I really can't talk outside of Manatee County because I don't know enough of the facts. Hi, Scott. Hello. Hello. Um, I would like to go back to your what you were telling us about the um, teenagers mm -hmm. that can pre-register. That's a question that I have. Um, 16 and 17 year olds that uh, pre-register to vote, where exactly are those numbers? We know what those numbers are because we get reports monthly, but where are they parked on the rolls right now? Are, they're not in inactive, but where are they? They're just, pre it's, a, it's a classification in our system so, called pre-registered. Then they're not adding additive to any of the other categories, right? Just, just pre-registered. Okay, so when they turn 18, does the system automatically put them in as an inactive or an active voter? It puts them in as an active voter. Active voter. And it automatically creates a voter information card that we send to the voter. It, it, it's okay. an automatic step. It's, right. yeah. So when they first register as a 16 or 17 year old, they're issued their voter ID at that time. Their ID number is is generated at that time. Okay. They're not issued the ID. See, I, they don't get a physical ID. No, no, I know it's a voter okay. ID number. Okay. Numeric. Okay, good. That answers that question. I always was wondering where you put them. Thank you. Okay, guys. Okay, we got one more question. Okay, who's got money? <laughs> How bad do you want to ask it? <laughs> yeah, that always drives up the question. <laughs> All right. You got money? You got, you got, did you put money in the pot? Yeah, I do it Okay, okay, just wanted to check. We didn't get money out of this one. <laughs> uh, just one question. I get an absentee ballot. Now, you said things quit in 2022. Am I going to have to reapply to get an absentee ballot? If you were getting absentee ballots before, December 2022, all absentee ballots requests were canceled. There were no. January 1st, 2023, there were no absentee ballots, vote by mail requests on file. So if you want an absentee ballot, and that goes for everybody, if you have not re-requested since January 1st of 2023, you must do so in order to get a vote by mail ballot in 2024. How do we do that? Call you? You can call our office, you can go to our website. You, on our website, you can go through and do it through the website. You can call our office and, and they'll do it right over the phone. Um, they, you have to provide either your driver's license number or the last four digits of your social security number in order to make that request. Okay. I have a question. Is it possible to have one day voting? It's okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a double man. Sorry. Is it possible to have one day voting? Yeah, I mean, like, like suggesting that, you know, we do, let's just go back to one day voting yeah. in yes. person. Precinct, small precinct. Yeah, is that, small is that even doable from your balance. point of view? Can't no. Balance. No? Not. Not anymore. Not anymore? <laughs> Not anymore. Why? There's two reasons. One is people don't want it. And that's my proof that people don't want it. Two, we can't get the precincts anymore. One of our biggest challenges now is getting physical precincts. It hasn't always been that way, but now it is a huge challenge for us. The reason? There's a, a few reasons. But one is churches don't want to do it anymore. Lot, we still have a lot of churches. I'm not saying all churches, but we've had a lot of churches that have said no thank you. And for several reasons. One is they, they started a school. They don't want to have kids on the, their campus and have a bunch of voters coming in now. I totally get it. Another reason, by state law, in order to be a polling place, you must, on election day, allow anybody on your property to campaign. I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't said this yet, but this abortion amendment specifically really worries me. I think we're going to have quite a few churches that decide they don't want to be polling places anymore. Once they find out, they must allow people on their property that says vote yes for abortion or whatever the sign is going to say. They're not going to like that and they're not going to want it. And so we as a society, as a community, community centers have gone by the wayside. So we are, rely very heavily on churches and and things like that. And we schools came up. I've heard that. Um, we currently don't use any schools. And the reason we don't use any schools is because the schools aren't willing to close their buildings to the, the kids on election day. In order to use a school now as a polling location, Everybody has to get background checked before they go into the secured area. The secured area since, I don't know, about two, three years ago, they put a fence around the entire, basically every school in Nancy County has a fence around the entire property. To get inside that fence, you generally have to go through what they call their Viper system, which is where they scan your, your ID, your driver's license, what all it checks, I have no idea, but we can't require voters to go through that in order to vote. So schools, unless we can talk the schools into shutting down on election days, we can't really use the school. Um, um, so my, my answer, my short answer is no, I don't see the gene going back in that bottle. Uh, and again, I don't think the voters, the mass of voters want it to, and that's my proof. Um, I do see, I, honestly, I think vote by mail is going to dip from what we had in 2020. And I think early voting is going to jump from what we had in 2020. That's my prediction. Um, because people still like in-person voting. Early voting allows people to vote earlier, but still be in person. Has anybody talked about making uh, Election Day a federal holiday? It has come up several times. Right. Now, what I'm going to say is a federal holiday doesn't actually fix my problem because that's one day. That's November. Yep. It's not the primary. It's not the PPP because those don't happen on the same day across the, the country. Okay. Could be a state holiday. That helps. But if I have a special election, I still, it puts me back in a big box. So it's been talked about. It, it hasn't gone very so far So how would you get that to be a thing? Would you have a petition signed by the thousands of you, people to get it on the ballot? How would you make that happen? You could either A, get 900,000 people to sign a petition in the state of Florida and make it a constitutional <laughs> amendment. Mm -hmm. Probably not your best bet. Best bet would be to go to your representative, yeah. your state representative, your state senator, and say, I think this is important. Talk to enough of them, convince them, get the law changed. That, that schools must have a records day, I don't care what to call it, on the days of voting, whether it be the PPP, the primary, the general. The primaries in August is usually not the issue, it's the general and the PPP. They do do it in other states. 
Yeah. 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 It's a I, thing. I have you heard that it. they do, yes. Yeah, I came yeah. from Connecticut two years ago. I was going to get the label for it. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I know Georgia, if I'm not mistaken, most of Georgia's is in fire stations. Yeah. Yeah. Having said that, understand that there's a big difference between Connecticut and Georgia and Florida. Remember <laughs> I talked about the smallest county had about 4,500 registered voters? Mm -hmm. Miami has a 1.5 million. Yeah. We're at 265,000. Even if we use every high school, that's not enough. We would have to use every high school. The problem is if I use every high school and middle school, the middle schools are usually too close to the high schools. It doesn't make sense to use both of them in the elementary school. So it still doesn't fix the problem. It just drastically helps it. In Texas, we had them at the elementary schools. Yeah, yeah but that was Texas when they lost. Yeah, we're <laughs> Everything in Texas is Yeah, you Well, and honestly, I remember when I um, was in Indiana, I remember going to the high school gymnasium with my parents. And this was back when they were, went into this little thing and they pulled a lever and the curtain fell behind them. I remember doing that. And it was a high school gymnasium. So the, um, the idea is not foreign. It's just with the Lunsford Act and the secured school security, the way it's been the last 10 years, those aren't really currently options for us unless they're willing to close. <laughs> okay, one last question, John. You've been putting money in the pot. We put money in the pot, so I get the money. Uh, I mean, one thing that I've been curious about, I was swimming in Florida, uh, the drop boxes. Are they brought in uh, when the polls close so that no one can drop? Uh, mail or dial or 10 at 3 in the morning because so we I have, don't understand why that wouldn't be. Right. We have a drop box at our office and then a drop box at every early vote site. Those drop boxes are empty every night at the close of polls. Um, for early voting, the close of polls is usually 6 p.m. For our office, we, you know, we kind of match that. So at 6 p.m., those drop boxes are closed. Uh, we empty them. We count the, the vote by mail ballots. They re are returned to our office. They are not accessible or opened again until the next morning when it pulls open. Are they monitored? They are monitored. By law, they must be monitored. So, so that's not the case. We're going to the three in the morning situation. That's not the case. It's not an option. Safe, though, which doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the post rules are closed. All right. Since I'm the last one with a microphone and I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Okay, before everybody gets up and goes crazy, well, or just gets up, some of you were crazy while you were still sitting down. Uh, just one thing, uh, has anybody heard of The Fall of Minneapolis? It's a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's on YouTube. The hour and 42 minutes.